and then I can just say hello and good morning, good afternoon or good evening to everyone who's joining us from various parts of the world. Uh, my name is Sean Kelly. I'm the Interim General Director of the Nanotechnology Industries Association. And it's a great pleasure for me today to say hello to three really good speakers who are going to be talking around the subject of advanced materials and nanomaterials and space. Uh, just a very brief introduction about the NIA and what it is that we do. The NIA is effectively the trade association for the nanotechnology sector. Uh, we help companies with regulatory pathways to market, providing confidence in nanomaterials across the supply chain, helping people find the right people, the right sectors, the right places to identify nanomaterial opportunities and to bring their materials forward into the market and to help people understand where they are in the value chain, to understand all about the end of life, recycling, disposal, use of nanomaterials, as well as the research and development and the manufacturing. We help support the developments in nanotech innovations, allowing the market to grow, allowing there to be a robust and stable regulatory framework, helping our members with networking and promotion, and building together a global commercial nanotechnology ecosystem so we can make sure that nanomalable products are actually arriving on the market and serving consumer need. Our members are drawn from three categories. Uh, we have commercial producers and users of nanomaterials. Uh, we have professional products and service providers and research and associations. So inside the NIA, there is a place for all the people involved in the entire nano manufacturing value chain. For our members, we offer a lot of support around uh, policy and regulations helping people understand the various legislations that are in place and standards, helping them understand OECD test guidelines, the safe and sustainable innovation approach, and everything around advanced materials, issues around trade, and about bringing together stakeholders both within the EU and globally. Our science and networking activity includes webinars such as these uh, around actual nano, what we call nano in action, so where we see nano going to various places of the market, we have a large and growing LinkedIn community, which allows people to communicate between each other. We run various events and also get involved in quite a few collaborative projects around the research side of bringing nano to the market. We encourage everybody to get involved with the network. So whether you register for our newsletter, follow us on LinkedIn or follow us on Twitter, or indeed become a member and help drive some of our activities to sort of set industrial priorities, be part of these important conversations and showcase and network for your own organisation and your own business development. But we would encourage people to at least register for the newsletter, follow us on LinkedIn. It's a great way of staying in touch with the things that we do. Uh, for membership itself, we run a yearly membership scheme for organisations with a cost based upon people's... <coughs> where they come from, the size of their organisation and the category of their organisation. If anyone has any questions, feel free to contact me. Uh, my email address is on the slides and then I can hopefully answer any of your questions. But today it's not really about the NIA itself, it's about nano in space. So I've got a great pleasure to introduce three really good speakers today. We'll start off with Yolanda from Technalia. And she's going to be talking about nanotechnology in the Basque Country, the work that's going on there from Earth to space. Then we have Joseph from the University of Leeds, and he's going to be looking at very particularly how you manufacture in a reduced gravity environment. So how will we actually get there to actually be able to get into the point where we can launch space vehicles and go into space and actually start doing things in space that we would need to do to go even further. And we conclude with Jonathan from Sierra Space in the US, who's going to be talking about low earth orbit manufacturing and a good overview on advanced materials. So on that, I shall now be quiet really quickly, hand over to Yolanda, and just to let people know that Yolanda unfortunately can only stay to give her talk. So if there's any specific questions to Yolanda's talk, if people either put them in the chat during the talk or raise their hand at the end, we can ask Yolanda the questions, and then we'll have a further Q&A after Joseph and Jonathan have spoken. So on that, I shall be quiet now, ask Yolanda to share her slides and hand over. Thank you. Thank you, Sean.
Hold on. Okay, can everybody see this? Perfectly, thank you, Yolanda. Okay, well, first of all, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever everybody in this uh, webinar is. And thank you very much to uh, Nanotechnologies Industry Association for the invitation to uh, talk a little bit today about nanotechnology in the Basque Country, uh, where we're aiming to address industrial and societal challenges. And as you will see, I will try to start off in, uh, from the point of view, the, earth, the perspective of uh, challenges that we have nowadays in Earth. But uh, I hope to give you a flavor towards the end of what we can hope, hope for in the future in the space sector. So first, as I say, let's start with our planet Earth. Uh, Technalia, the organization that I belong to, is in Europe. It's the largest uh, research and technology organization in Spain. And I'm personally located in Bilbao. This is our Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao River. And uh, we are part of a larger association called the Basque Research and Technology Alliance. Um, and you will see that this has uh, recently brought together uh, a great number of research and technology organizations in the Basque country. Okay, I'll tell you a little bit about the Basque country. For those of you who don't know who we are, the Basque region is a small part, a small region in, in the north of Spain, uh, only a population of 2 million inhabitants. These are the three, three main cities in the Basque region. It's a very industrial region with a, a huge activity in the fields of energy and health. And it's the highest industrialized, a very high, highly industrialized area. Uh, very much industry to do with manufacturing, automotive, aeronautics, energy, health, and um, spanning all of the three provinces of the Basque region. The highest rate of productivity in Europe is here in this region. It's a, we have highly specialized subcontractors across all industrial sectors for many international company, uh, companies in the world, and multinational companies and across all of the sectors, transport, energy, health, construction. And uh, we have an expenditure in R&D around 2% of our GDP. And the Basque technology parks are about 5% of the employment in the Basque region and bring together incubator centers, cooperative research centers, research and technology organizations working across many different fields of technologies. Of course, nanosciences is included in these. We have Basque uh, Excellence Centers as well, research centers, uh, as well as the Basque University. So there is a huge ecosystem for nanotechnology uh, between the Technalia and IK4, our counterpart. We have around 3,000 researchers. And Technalia is around 1,500 in total. So I just wanted to give you this very brief overview. Many people have not heard about the Basque region, so now, now you have. Now, we are, as I mentioned, the largest technology organization in Spain, one of the largest in Europe. We're a benchmark center in Europe, working across many different fields of technology, as I'll mention uh, in a moment. But first of all, I want to say, give you a few figures on our activity, our income. Our annual income is approximately around 115 million euros. About half of that is coming from private contracts, services, and direct contracts with companies. And the other half is coming from public funding. Around 30% of that uh, is from competitive public funding, of which around 21% is coming from Europe. Uh, we are uh, working, uh, our scopes of action are aligned with the sustainable development goals. We are working in energy transition, personalized health, sustainable mobility, smart manufacturing, urban ecosystem, and digital transformation. And for this, we have identified inside of Technalia those technologies that are key enabling technologies 
or technologies where we have a, a large critical mass of researchers working on applications across many different uh, industrial sectors. Uh, so, for instance, automation, robotics, and mechatronic control, cyber security and blockchain, computer vision and visual interaction, surface engineering, artificial intelligence and big data, metallic materials, and the associated processes and products, nanotechnology, which is of interest to us today, polymers, composites, and bio-based materials, as well as embedded electronic systems, power and control electronics, and finally, software technologies. Now, as I say, we have many other technologies at Technalia, apart from those listed here, but these are the ones where we have, a, shall we say, a larger critical mass. And they're also transversal to different in industrial sectors. So these are identified as a high priority at Technalia. So as you can see, nanotechnology is at the core of our research and technology strategy. And this helps us with our mission at Technalia, which is to uh, develop profit for companies, creating growth and value for society, improving society. Now, as I mentioned, we are part of a larger structure. Quite recently, uh, it was created by the Basque government. It's called the Basque Research and Technology Alliance. I will give you some information, more detailed information. Uh, its uh, aim, the aim of creating this alliance has been to meet the Basque industry's industrial challenges and to be able to compete with larger leading corporations in the international arena, working in technological research, and development. This alliance is spearheaded in Basque research in Europe and also in the rest of the world. It's an established consortium now. We've been working together for several years and we have a collaboration agreement with all of the members, the 17 scientific and technology agents, um, which I will um, list in the next slide. Now, the mission of BRTA is to guarantee cooperation and the creation of synergies between agents within that consortium, bringing the most of the investment and in technology in the Basque region, meeting technological and industrial challenges, both of the Basque country and in the world. So here are the BRTA members. At the top, there are four uh, cooperative research centers. As you can see, I've listed first uh, Nanogune, Thick Nanogune, which is the one related to nanotechnology. There is also one related to biomaterials, another one uh, dealing with energy-related technologies, and another one on biotechnologies. The rest are all research and technology organizations, of which Technalia is by far the largest. Uh, some figures from 2021. Our, uh, we are uh, at BRTA around 4,000 researchers with, with 337 million revenue, annual revenue, about 40% uh, coming from private funding and about 60% coming from pub public funding. And participating in around 670 European projects with around 1,600 publications, 112 patents, and around 10 million euros coming from licensing and patent revenue, around 26 million. Uh, of revenue coming from new startups created by BRTA, and of the 337 million annual income, around 70 million is from international projects. Now I want to come back to nanotechnology and uh, mention a few uh, numbers. So the total value of nanomaterials exceeds 7 billion, exceeded, sorry, um, 7 million euros in 2019. There's a rapid increase uh, expected in the coming years with a compound annual growth rate of 13% from 2020 to 2027. Additionally, it's extremely important to recognize that all the products that depend on nanomaterials and nanotechnology already represent 200,000 million euros worldwide. So it's a huge uh, field with a huge economic impact. And this has given their progressive adaptation in many industries, such as health, biotechnology, transportation, etc., and space. <laughs> Only in the EU, around 300,000 to 400,000 jobs are directly associated with the nanomaterials sector, which is actually leading to it being uh, an essential part of the EU's vision for the future in the manufacture of advanced materials. 
Now, in the Basque region, coming back to uh, the smaller uh, scale, um, in the Basque region, in the early 2000s, the Basque government identified very quickly this opportunity and uh, invested a lot of money in this uh, field. Uh, they recognized the emerging importance of nanomaterials and nanotechnology way back then with a huge investment, both in research infrastructures, for instance, in technology centers like Technalia, also in funding a huge number of R&D pro projects. And then finally also with the creation of a specific cooperative research center in nanotechnology called Nanobune. In addition, uh, the Nanobasque strategy uh, was implemented. This was from 2008 to 2015. And there was a very strategic project led by the Basque government called EHS Advance, which stands for Environment, Health and Safety Impact of Nanotechnology, EHS. And this project was launched to support Basque companies in the areas of environmental impact, consumer health and worker uh, safety related issues or worries that they had related to nanotechnology back then. This involved several pioneering uh, technology centers in the Basque region, uh, including Geiker, who was leading the project, Nalia, of course, and Techniker. Um, the technology advances in, in nanotechnology and then their industrial application were already a central component of the Science, Technology, and Innovation Plan, and uh, what's called the PCTI, the Plan of the Basque Country for Science and Technology. Uh, in the year 2020, and their importance was uh, recently again identified in the new strategy 2030, where the potential to create disruptive innovations has been identified again. So we continue to have uh, a huge support at a regional level uh, for our research in this field. The Basque Country has highly relevant advanced infrastructures, as I've mentioned, which have been developing over the last decade, as well as the knowledge and experience of the many research uh, teams and, and all of the uh, members of BRTA. And uh, in addition, uh, there are significant uh, R&D activities in nanomaterials and nanotechnologies, uh, other organizations which are not yet members of BRTA, such as Basque University, Mondragon University, the Center for Materials Physics, Donostia International Physics Center, and other institutions adequately aligned with those objectives of BRTA. So BRTA has identified nanotechnology as a key enabling technology for the development of new products, mainly advanced materials. Across a huge range of industrial sectors, for example, manufacturing, health, energy, construction, transport, and in this endeavor, the first stage is always to generate <clears throat> new knowledge. So in nanoscience and in nanotechnology. And this, this knowledge can lead to high added value materials and products, ensuring the necessary economic impact and the associated <clears throat> job creation coming from, the, from these industrial applications. Well, sorry. <clears throat> Well, taking into account not just the economic impact, but also societal issues uh, and other issues such as environmental health and safety impacts of nanotechnology. Now, the R&D activities at BRTA go from lab to pilot scale. They span the whole industrial value chain, <clears throat> all the way from nanomaterials, such as graphene, nanocellulose, nanoparticles, nanofibers, all the way to the final nanotechnology-based products, which can either be nanostructure materials or nanomaterial containing 3D or 2D materials, or composites of different chemical nature, metallic, polymeric, ceramic, etc. In addition, BRTA has a strong track record in nanomedicine. Now, state-of-the-art characterization for nanotechnology is also available, as well as the required expertise in modeling, the use of artificial intelligence, and the design of novel nanotechnology-enabled advanced materials is an emerging field, which is also receiving special attention. 
Now, at Technalia, we have uh, structured our activities into four uh, fields. The first one being the development of new nanomaterials. Here, we're talking about synthesis and functionalization of nanomaterials, such as nanoparticles, metallic, metal oxide, polymeric, lipidic, also nanofibers, mainly nanocellulose, many others, but nanocellulose is one of our key uh, activities. Graphene, we're also uh, working on, and other carbon-based structures. Our area of most activity, though, is in the application of those nanomaterials. So in the development of nano-enabled materials and products, and for this, we have knowledge in how to disperse nanomaterials and <clears throat> how to incorporate them into different bulk materials, as well as in coatings or in nanostructured surfaces. In order to develop advanced materials, as I mentioned before, polymeric, metallic, hybrid, ceramic, for different applications in health, energy, construction, autom automotive, space, and other applications. We also have a team working on Safe by Design. We're part of the EC for Safe Nano project, and uh, we have experts in nanotoxicology, ecotoxicology, regulations, and so on. And finally, as I mentioned, digital technologies are an emerging field at Technalia. Now, some examples of nanotechnology-based products that we have developed include aerogels, super insulation materials for more energy efficient buildings. So here we're looking at it from the other way around, something which was uh, developed for space application is being now uh, transferred towards a new application field, a new industrial sector. And how have we done this? Well, aerogels are very expensive. So we have developed our own uh, process, our own chemistry for this and our own process so that we can uh, reduce the cost. We can get a much cheaper aerogel, uh, starting from a silica-based uh, waste instead of uh, the most expensive, the very expensive uh, silicon alkoxide uh, precursors, which are usually used. And we use also a very environmentally friendly process, which does not require as much high uh, energy as the uh, aerogel production, the current aerogel production. Other examples, um, nanotechnology-based products at Technalia are uh, electric materials that we're developing for water desalination inside of the graphene flagship. But our activities span many kinds of materials and solutions, such as gas separation membranes. There we have a new company, a new startup company, which has around 50 employees already working on uh, hydrogen generation. We also have uh, patents and uh, developments in the fields of self-healing concrete, other self-healing materials, wear-resistant coatings, conductive inks for printed electronics, etc. So of all of these examples, some of them, such as, for instance, printed electronics or one which I have not uh, mentioned, which is lightweight composite materials, um, are being used, have been used in space-related projects. Okay, in terms of upcoming challenges in the field of nanotechnology, this is a bit of a maybe philosophical part of my talk. I think uh, uh, I would like to conclude by saying nanotechnology is already playing a fundamental role in supporting and uh, growth and competitiveness of manufacturing in the international arena, uh, not just for space and all industrial sectors. It allows the design and development of new materials with extraordinary properties and new functionalities for a wide range of applications, which cannot be achieved by any other means. So this field will lead to the need for new manufacturing processes. This we've seen, for instance, with the example I was telling you about aerogels for either their production or integration, as well as the need to upgrade existing production equipment. Most of our clients have their own industrial process when they want to integrate nanoparticles, nanomaterials, they have to think of a new way of producing their product to adapt to this. Uh, sorry, I'm maybe overrunning a little bit. <laughs> I'll just finish off. So nanotechnology, in my opinion, is going to play a huge, a key role in the development also of new, more sustainable advanced materials and products. Everything to do with uh, circular economy uh, will have something to do with nanotechnology. 
It also, it will have a lot of impact in processes necessary for manufacture, remanufacture, and recycling. Um, so uh, I think in the future, all new nano-enabled uh, materials and derived products will, will need to be designed to be more durable, of course, more environmentally friendly and easier to recycle, as well as possessing uh, other functional or multifunctional properties necessary to meet the product requirements and our ambitious uh, societal challenges. Okay, I'll skip over the last uh, slide there uh, just to come to my conclusion. So from my talk, I would like to summarize in saying that the Basque Country has had a remarkable track record in terms of regional public investment in industrial nanotechnology and advanced materials research, as well as in the participation of EU funded product, uh, projects. Uh, in this particular topic, uh, we have a huge uh, amount of projects in open innovation test beds, before that on pilot projects, uh, because one of our aims is to take the nanotechnology to industry. So there we need to go to scale up. We know that one of the main barriers is this, is the scale up of the new nanotechnology enabled manufacturing process. Uh, both for nanomaterial and nano-enabled uh, material production. Another barrier is still, uh, sad to say, the uncertainty surrounded many safety-related issues, uh, and in some cases still the lack of specific regulations, although the European Union has addressed this by encouraging the safe by design approach. Finally, I uh, just want to conclude by saying nanotechnology is a key enabling technology for developing new materials, products, and solutions to humanity's needs, both here on Earth and in space. Now, the next part of my talk will be available uh, to all of you, um, and I'm, I, I've run out of time, and this is a more general part, but I'll just go over this slide quickly. Technalia is working in the space sector, but not only in nanotechnology. We work across many different technologies, materials technologies, digital technologies, um, and also hardware technologies, robotics, and so on. Uh, in terms of materials, here you can see we're working on different projects related to composites, functional printing, surface engineering, metallic materials, and materials for extreme conditions. Uh, these are some examples of project references Technalia has worked on uh, for the space sector. Unfortunately, I can't go into detail uh, in, uh, on all of these, but you can, you can have all of this information afterwards. And please feel free to contact me if you have any information on any of the particular examples that you can see here. There is one particular example that I want to mention, which is an electronic uh, housing uh, box where we have substituted the very heavy weight metallic enclosure for the electronic box with a composite which weighs, which has a much lighter weight. And, uh, and this uh, lightweight box, composite box, uh, has the same thermal dissipation properties as the metallic one. And there we have used nanotechnology to uh, achieve this goal. So there are some other uh, more recent examples here. For instance, I mentioned printed electronics. And um, well, you can see that there is a huge track record of Technalia working uh, across all different types of materials for. Uh, space sector. But what I would like to do, rather than go into detail in all of these, is to give you the information of our contact person for all activities related to space, not just nanotechnology. So uh, Garbine Achaga, this is her email address. She is the person responsible who coordinates internally all the space activities and ESA tenders. So with this, I would like to now finalize. Thank you all for your attention, and I'm open to questions. Thank you very much. Thank you ever so much, Yolanda, for that. So I'll open the floor to, <clears throat> to questions. So if anybody has a question, if you just want to uh, raise your hand, then obviously you can unmute yourself and ask a question. But, Yolanda, whilst uh, maybe people are thinking of questions, yeah. one of the things that really strikes me is nanotechnology obviously isn't just the only solution for space. So really, it's, a big, it's going to be the importance, isn't it, of how you can integrate nanotechnology into existing areas uh, of technology or indeed to come up with sort of new solutions. Uh, is that something sort of from a technology perspective that you're definitely seeing as well? 
Absolutely. Yeah, as I mentioned, when you saw the slide, uh, the, the final slides, uh, most of our activities in space are actually uh, outside of the nanotechnology uh, realm. This is something quite recent at Technalia. We've had a few projects uh, with uh, nanotechnology, but it's become very apparent that, as you say, not everything can be addressed with nanotechnology, but there are many things that cannot be addressed with, without it. <laughs> so we can we can come to the to the middle from both points of view. Yeah. I agree that not everything will be nanotechnology-based solutions, but that nanotechnology will play a key role in space uh, applications, yeah. Okay, and then we've got a question from uh, back here. It's, uh, do you use nanometrology in any of your processes? Nanometrology, do you mean, for instance, measuring particle size in the air? What kind of nanometrology? Could you, could you please uh, give more? Okay, if you if you want to just you switch your microphone on, you can actually ask the question. But I presume otherwise, I presume he the, the meaning is nanometrology, as in the measurement uh, at the nanoscale. Yeah, we have equipment for measuring nanoparticle size and so on. We are not a service provider in that field, uh, but we use it for our own research. So, for instance, we need to me measure nanoparticle size by using the usual equipment like the Malvern set uh, TEM, AFM, different techniques we are using for nanoparticle size uh, Hi, uh, sorry, yeah, hi. just to clarify. Uh, yeah. So, so what I mean, yeah, using yeah. those equipment, but uh, do you, you know, how do you calibrate them or how do you achieve traceability? Oh, like, okay. I, I think uh, I couldn't give you the information on how you calibrate equipment. If you send me an email, I can put you in touch with the person who can okay. answer Thank you very much. specific question. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you very much. No worries. Okay. And on that, unless there's any further questions, because I know, Yolanda, that you do need to leave. I do need to uh, leave. I'm really happy that I could I could join you. And uh, as I said, we are really keen to find collaborators and to increase our activities in nanotechnology for the space sector. So please feel free to contact either myself or my colleague, Garminia, and uh, we'll be very happy to discuss any possible collaborations. Perfect. Well, thank you ever so much, Yolanda. Thanks, and we'll everyone. let you get off now. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, we'll turn now to our second speaker, uh, and that's Joseph Anthony from the University of Leeds. So if you want to start sharing your slides, Joseph, I can yeah. hand over to you. And for questions, uh, what I suggest is we'll hear from Joseph, and then we'll move straight on to hear from Jonathan, and then we'll do uh, a sort of a QA and a at the end for both of those talks together, if that's okay. So, Joseph, I'll hand directly over to you. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, my name is uh, Joseph Anthony. I am from the University of Leeds in the United Kingdom. Uh, what I'm going to talk today is uh, to give some highlights of modeling the flow and compaction characteristics of particulate materials. So, so I take it in a broader sense, nanoparticles. They also could be micro nano regimes. Uh, especially under reduced gravity environments. Uh, sorry. So I hope, uh, uh, I'm sure you would have already heard of uh, Leeds. Uh, it's in uh, uh, United Kingdom here. Leeds is somewhere here. It's surrounded by quite a lot of uh, university cities like Sheffield, Liverpool, Manchester, uh, York, uh, Hull, and so on. So it's, uh, it's uh, somewhere at the north of uh, uh, United Kingdom. Uh, as far as Leeds University is concerned, now we have about 36,000 students in different faculties and engineering greater than 3,000 students uh, from more than 100 countries now. And it's one of the top 100 universities in the world and so on. So in terms of uh, uh, the contributions, I think if you have heard of uh, X-ray diffraction theory, Bragg theory, basically, uh, uh, he was working as a professor in physics here in uh, Leeds University at that time. So my kind of uh, direction is uh, uh, the mechanic side of it, uh, of discrete and continuum materials at different scales. Uh, so normally I work on uh, two tracks here, uh, experimental mechanics side, as well as the computational mechanics side. 
on the experimental mechanics side, I use a lot of characterization of particulate systems like atomic force microscopy, shear cells, and so on. And recently, we are exploring this to with the application of uh, photostress analysis, uh, DPAV, digital particle image velocity metry, IR tomographies, and things like this. So we bring this knowledge together with the computational means like discrete element modeling, finite element modeling, theoretical and MD simulations together uh, to get a better understanding of uh, how stress and the strain displacements occur in discrete particulate systems at micro scale, nano scale, especially for reduced gravity environments as well as well as for other applications. Just before I give uh, uh, my talk to reduced gravity environment, I want to give you one or two quick examples of uh, how complex these uh, discrete particulate systems are. Uh, let's imagine that uh, we send some particulate materials and they get a pile like this, a conical pile. And uh, uh, usually I'm interested to predict the pressure distribution at the base of this, this, this pile. And if we ask you to assume the pressure distribution, normally you would expect that the pressure is going to be maximum here. So you would get a pressure profile, something like this to expect a maximum pressure distribution at this particular point. But in discrete particulate systems, it's also perfectly possible that you may not get a maximum pressure distribution right at where you are physically seeing this maximum pile here, but rather at that point, you may get a minimum pressure as well. It's a perfect possibility. And you may get a maximum pressure distribution somewhere around here. And this is one of the complexities of discrete particulate systems to understand this non-homogeneous force transmission in discrete system is a very complex task. And the reason that uh, people are coming up with, for example, this shows a conical pile and using optical stress analysis, what these lines are showing is the force transmission pathways. So in this particular case, what has happened is all these forces are dispersed in a kind of inclined fashion like arch action like what you are seeing here. So by the time if you put a pressure gauge at that spot here and that will be picked by a tiny amount of or a small region of network of that particles that are transmitting this pressure and remaining pressures are already dispersed through this arch action. And that's the number of particles usually transmitting these very strong contacts, these red lines that you are seeing here, which are responsible for bearing most of this load is about one third of the total number of contacts or total number of particulate systems. And that's where it's completely non-homogeneous and understanding these properties gets much more complex. And just to highlight that point, uh, let's imagine that there is an assembly of a particulate system here, and this is subjected to triaxial compression shearing. And uh, what I'm plotting here is the macroscopic shear strength to the left-hand side of this axis here. Uh, so this, this is a bulk quantity, the bulk shear strength of this particulate system. Of course, in this case, this is normalized to the mean pressure during this shearing. So it's uh, just a normalization process. What this left-hand side reflects is, is the bulk macroscopic shear strength. And what the right-hand side axis, what it plots here is in, as I told you, this force transmission is completely non-homogeneous. About one third of the particles transmit most of these strong forces. And if we derive the anisotropic signature of these strong forces by a certain way, and we can plot that anisotropic fabric anisotropy of these very strong forces, strong contacts, and that's what which is plotted by a factor what's called K here. And what you see is an excellent match between this bulk macroscopic strength that we are testing with particulate system uh, to the fabric anisotropy of this limited number of contacts, about one third of the contacts. So the microscopic origin of this bulk shear strength in discrete particulate systems, they come from a contribution of not necessarily due to all the particles, but due to the active contribution of a small fraction of the particles. And that's where the force transmissions and the mechanics of this discrete particulate systems gets much more complex. So with that kind of little bit information, uh, now what I'm going to focus here is to briefly tell you about this micro nanomechanical behavior of particulate systems 
with consideration to low gravity environments here, they are extremely important in space applications, for example, in the design of sample preparation and distribution systems and in situ resource utilization and their flow properties, compaction properties of these particulate systems are extremely important. For example, once the space, space cross, for example, or the moss lands on the surface of the moss, and before you do a chemical analysis, it's also important to take these grains and create a compact and a reduced gravity and you can do some chemical stations and subjected certain experimental conditions to that and to understand their basic properties. So one of these key factor is how to create a compact at reduced gravity that becomes very important. And that's where the kind of modeling technique I'm going to quickly highlight could be much more informative and useful. As well as they are important in ground exploration activities like moss, moons, and so on. I am sure you, you already appreciate that. Uh, and the computational modeling is, is a quite, uh, quite, <clears throat> a quite useful tool considering the fact that uh, doing reduced gravitational experiments are not that easy. For example, if you use parabolic flights, the duration of that reduced gravity is, is, is not uh, very long. Uh, 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 so in that this kind of cases, uh, probably during that snapshot time, perhaps you can compare that activity with the, with the simulation technique, then perhaps you can, if, if the comparison is reasonable, you can stick with simulation techniques to extend for longer durations and understand this material processing behavior of particulate systems. So when it comes to uh, computational analysis, perhaps we can go through on a couple of tracks. Uh, one way that uh, I will use in this talk is using a technique called discrete element modeling. In a discrete element modeling, whatever that particles that you are initially taking, perhaps you can initially characterize these key property particle scale properties, then you can feed that information into this discrete element modeling. Basically, it can factor into the properties of every single particle that we consider into that system, uh, subject to certain boundary conditions that's relevant to the application case. And on the other hand, you can go for continuum analysis somewhere in between. There are methods like a discrete layer approach. What it means is rather than taking every single particle as such, which is computationally expensive as well, uh, perhaps we can take a layer of these particles and the, keeping the layer size so small, uh, which could be somewhere uh, increasing the speed of these computations one step further. So there are some techniques available. Of course, there are some other techniques like CREA structural models and things like this. Basically, these are a continuum kind of approaches. So there is a trade-off that uh, if we go to discrete and individual factoring of individual particles into your simulation, it's going to be more computationally expensive. Uh, perhaps uh, continuum kind of theories could be a little bit much more quicker. And there is a trade-off into this. So depending on what you are looking for, then you can make a trade-off and uh, take it from there. And the flow behavior of grains under low gravity environments that they have been looked into by other researchers as well. And basically the conclusions that differ from these studies. And at the end of the day, what it means is it depends on, it, 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 it's quite difficult to formulate a generic conclusion to based on one type of a particulate system and an nanopowder system or a micropowder systems. Uh, rather the approach needs to be looked into for factoring into real particle scale properties, meaning that one type of material may not describe in the generic sense that we need to repeat this for material specific uh, kind of investigation. And here I'm going to quickly focus to start with uh, 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 the angle of repose initially. And here I am taking a sand grains, uh, and I'm going to illustrate how discrete element modeling is done and how these simulations compare with actual predictions. Basically, this uh, this is uh, done for certain uh, space applications. So it's a kind of a typical chamber that you are taking here that is schematically drawn here. And these are the dimensions of that. So this is the initial geometry here. And uh, we are going to send uh, these uh, sand grains uh, at this initial first state here uh, uh, in terms of the initial uh, packing densities and things like that. You can characterize them. And I'm going to subject that to different gravity environments that you are seeing here. G stands for Earth gravity, so one sixth of Earth gravities and so on. And you can initially assign these particle scale properties and wall stiffness and the friction between the particles and the ratio between norm normal stiffness to tangential stiffnesses, so all these are 
can be filled into discrete Telman modeling. In other words, particle scale properties can be uh, filled into discrete Telman modeling. And uh, for example, here, what you see here is uh, only, uh, only the uh, earth gravity is different here. This is a typical discrete Telman modeling that you are seeing. Initial packing conditions were exactly the same, only the gravity effects were different here. As you see, the earth gravity flow is already complete here and mass gravity is somewhere around half and lunar is extremely complex here. So all these things can be predicted using discrete element modeling much more realistically. And concerning the fact that in actual uh, filling processes, we need to estimate how much time a holder needs to be kept into actual process stations to collect the samples under reduced gravities. And this type of information can be predicted using discrete element modeling. And we can also predict this uh, flow, flow rates uh, through these different chambers and you can normalize with respect to you have the gravity here and this is a typical plot of uh, how these flow rates could be decreasing significantly with the reduction in a gravity environment level and uh, we can also simultaneously develop some theoretical approaches because we appreciate that using discrete element modeling for all big scale applications may not be so quick it's computationally expensive so simultaneously for certain cases we can develop theoretical approaches as well then we can we can compare them and see to what cases we can perhaps stick with continuing approaches and so on. So basically, they provide uh, some uh, uh, advantages uh, to us. So very quickly, uh, sorry, uh, I'm just uh, magnifying this up, right? Okay. <clears throat> Uh, we also compare some of the trends that we observe from these uh, parabolic flights and uh, try to cross compare that with the simulations as well and make sure that the simulations are uh, uh, reflective of what the true behavior is here. For example, here what this what this shows here is this the sample flow was subjected to a lunar gravity level and uh, and the flight conditions wanted to increase the gravity to to G naught. So we were applying that condition as well and to make sure that whatever that we observe in reduced gravity flight conditions uh, are also reflected in our discrete element simulations to be, to be a little more confident. So in terms of this, uh, uh, now we look into how these particles have fallen and what kind of angle of repose that has been uh, that has been experimentally measured in these uh, parabolic flights here, and they are reported by Nakashima here. So these are the values in relation to the gravity levels that you are seeing here. And uh, Nagashima, he himself reported some two-dimensional discrete element modeling. So these are the ranges, ranges of angular repose that you're seeing with respect to the left-hand side here. And uh, the comparison is not too great. So what we did is we did a little more rigorous three-dimensional uh, discrete element modeling here. And the, and, and the values are uh, much more closer to what's actually observed in experiments. But in terms of the angle of repose, the story is not complete. For certain particles, uh, the angle of repose can increase with gravity slightly and in, in some cases it can decrease as well and uh, there, there's a quite a lot of literature review on this so end of the day the message is that uh, for uh, for uh, these kind of studies and simulations needs to be done specific to what type of particles are because the behaviors could be uh, could be different this is a kind of a typical example of uh, how different this uh, angle of repose could be for uh, different gravity environments for the type of particles that we took beforehand. And uh, using discrete element modeling, I will not go too much of details of this, just to quickly highlight that uh, they provide lots of opportunities to test these uh, flow rates here. For example, what you are seeing is a flow rate normalized to the flow rate corresponds to earth gravity here. And you can evaluate this for different porosity conditions, uh, corresponds to different earth gravity, mass gravity, and lunar gravity. What you see straight away is that the porosity effect is perhaps a little bit diminishing with much reduction in gravity level because uh, lunar gravity is about one sixth of earth gravity, whereas in this, these effects can be much more stronger in, uh, with slightly increase in gravity levels. So that's the message uh, that I want to quickly show you. And uh, uh, discrete Terman modeling also provides a lot of opportunities in the sense that you can get snapshot of whatever that happens during the uh, whole journey. So we can put these visualizations and try to see how systems behave. And also you can, for example, this is a typical case of uh, the effect of contact stiffness. This, 
stiffness between these individual particles and in a, in a varying gravity environment, uh, how the flow rates are getting affected here, like what you are seeing here with increase in contact stiffness, the flow rate a little bit drops down here. And there are some experimental evidences and some uh, previous kind of indications to this in the in the literature for example a reduction in contact stiffness is perhaps towards this a soft particulate system and these are the hard particulate systems when it goes to a little bit harder particulate system the flow rate drops down and the, one of the explanations could be soft particles they deform much more uh, dissipate uh, a contact energy much better than or much more than the hard particulate system, which, which helps to reorganize these flow networks uh, favorable to the flow of these particulates is a possibility. Yeah. And uh, we also look into how this uh, flow can be, flow rates can be enhanced and slightly changed. So you can put a vibrator into the system and try to understand the micro nano mechanical behavior of these particulates during vibration as well is a possibility, just a capability demonstration that I'm talking through. Using Diskitelman modeling, we can also look into other kind of properties. For example, if you want to fill a, a, a jar with, with the particles that is coming from another device, uh, is it is it is it good to fill that continuously under earth gra reduced gravity or maybe can we fill in a staggered fashion and what kind of structural uh, kind of arrangements that happens in this collection chamber is something that we can uh, we were asked to look into and so these are some, some kind of uh, capabilities that we can look into in terms of different packing densities particle scale properties interaction loss between part real particles and so on they can be fed back and we can get into in the same way we can also do modeling for uh, drilling for compaction processes like this a typical example that you see here right? but, but it's it's under uh, earth gravity for example the compression strength that's uh, that's 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 plotted here and you can simultaneously for the same kind of environment except the gravity is different for lunar gravity the strength drops down significantly just an example of uh, telling the capability of using such a discrete element modeling if you want a little bit more rigorous information perhaps you can take this to one level down uh, perhaps we can go for molecular dynamics kind of simulations for nanoparticulate systems for example this is what we are predicting here is for titanium dioxide particle for different temperatures and you can get the surface energy of these particles in terms of the size of the particles as well so these real predictions can be picked depending on what type of TAO to structure that we are talking about whether it's anatase rotel and so on so it's a possible that we can go and level down and create this molecular dynamics kind of simulation, predict these properties and feed that as an input to discrete element modeling to the next level. And we can get much more realistic, coherent uh, computations as well. So to quickly tell you in uh, over a few slides in uh, two or three minutes, uh, some of the experimental advancements that we are uh, making here. Uh, and we realized that the simulations, so the accuracy depends on what kind of input properties we are feeding into. So it's always better to measure these properties as much as possible, than feed that into simulation as a starting point and get the uh, processing behavior that looks uh, much more realistic. And the other thing is uh, to flow properties, uh, we also use these advanced techniques like uh, particle image velocity metry, where you can track the motion of uh, individual particles as such here. Uh, sorry, if possible, I will quickly play a short video here uh, that, uh, that tells you, for example, if you have a collection of particles here that you are, uh, I hope you are able to see this, uh, this video. Can you see this video? No, the video is not playing, Joseph. But okay. Uh, so uh, sorry. Uh, so what I'm going to that's that's okay for the time being. So what I'm telling is that. Uh, the velocity of individual particles within the flow chamber can be also tracked down and they give quite a lot of additional information and if you want to get a little more information on uh, how this uh, digital particle image velocity metrics could be applied uh, perhaps you can look into some uh, further literatures uh, like what I was telling you in terms of different opening angle of this flow chambers uh, using digital particle image velocity meter, you can track the velocity fields and try to understand these fundamentals uh, much more uh, better. Uh, and for example, in explaining why 
the angle of if the opening angle is small you get a uniform flow and if the opening angle of these channels are getting bigger and bigger you get funnel flows so we can explain all this with the fundamentals using advanced techniques like digital particle image velocity metrics uh, and uh, hopefully we are uh, trying to do this kind of thing for uh, low gravitational environments as well and one of the important prospect the possibility that we need to look into perhaps in future is for example if you have a, a flow channel with grains you get get these anisotropic for structures. Information is not available. What would happen to this kind of a system if these particles are lower end of micro scale and tending towards nano scale? That's something that needs to be looked into in future. But as a starting point, what we created is instead of grains, big grains of 10 millimeters and so on, we created some powder systems. These are biofringent powders here. And you can pack them into different containers with a different opening angle. What you can get is the direction of the major principal stress and the the shear resistance that could happen to the side of this in terms of this deviator stress you can plot and you can get a lot of fundamental information and relate this to how these flow channels develop how local shear resistance are developing in terms of particle scale properties packing arrangements and so on that's something that's going on and also we take, uh, uh, we can use, uh, for example, uh, temperature measurements in two particulate systems, the flow channel, a tiny channel that you are seeing here. This is a kind of a temperature profile. You can track the evolution of this temperature profile during the flow, because during flow, every grains, when they slide, they emit a temperature, and that's an indication of energy dissipation into a granular flows like waterfalls flows, and they give additional information to answer some questions. So based on all these things recently, we, we gave some recipes to design these flow devices for certain uh, space applications and they have been implemented and also as i told you you can use a digital particle image velocity metric to get velocity fields for example this is a quick example of a granular field or a particulate field with the punch that's acting on the top here using particle image velocity metric you can track these velocity fields and you can develop failure envelopes and depending on these failure envelopes you can calculate the bearing capacity of the structure that's making these indentations and things like this and that's a possibility you can take this kind of applications to layered systems because for space applications it's not isotropic homogeneous layer it's a complex could be a layered system and if that's the case we can get information on these velocity fields failure envelopes and back calculate the bearing capacities in the interactive way and uh, if you have multiple kind of wheel systems such applications can be done of course for cyclic loading conditions as well <clears throat> And uh, using this optical stress analysis, for example, if you create a particulate system, but this time we added some host particles into a concrete structure here, using optical stress analysis, what it gives is the ability to show what happens ahead of a crack tip here. For example, there is a notch here, so you can it 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 uh, lights out the maximum shear that happens here, which is possible to predict this effective crack length. The effective crack length is the actual crack length uh, plus these characteristics of this fracture processing zone. So you can get to much better information to predict the fracture toughness. So bringing all these together, they try to help evaluating this uh, stress transmission and mechanical properties of this particular systems. So just to quickly conclude here, um, uh, very briefly, three-dimensional DM simulations, they are, as I told you, they can replicate this angle of repose measurements and other flow properties as well. And so they try to give you uh, much more information that's often difficult to measure from uh, just a parabolic flight or a drop tower test because the duration will be much smaller. Uh, uh, for the kind of Materials that I had shown uh, flow rate decreases with the increase in porosity or this effect is marginal in the case of uh, lunar gravity, meaning that higher reduction in gravity, this kind of information gets erased uh, and the characteristics of the flow properties are much more lower there. And the processability of hard grains under lunar environment could be much more difficult than, uh, for example, at a little increased gravity condition, Martian conditions. And that's something that needs to be looked into if you are designing to operate vehicles to stop over at moon before reaching on Mars. Uh, and as I have been telling you, this integrated experimental computational approaches promises a 
much better way forward rather than just sticking with simulations or experiments. We give basic information or the basic particle scale properties uh, from experiments, then using them into simulations. I think the results could be much more uh, accurate and scope for future. As I told you, uh, this kind of approaches for nano systems, they are not at well established, meaning that nano particulate systems, uh, these are not at well established there. There's a quite a lot of uh, room to look into with much more uh, real information like uh, cohesion properties, uh, hysteresis effects of these contacts, for example, when the particles approach, they may have a certain energy stickiness, when they retract, they may have, so the hysteresis effect is something that's not uh, looked into for uh, nanoparticle systems in a more detailed, more realistic and complex process, process environments could be looked into, uh, that's a possibility to advance these simulations in future, and uh, simultaneously technological advancements using nanotechnology would would also help to understand what happens into these particulate systems under processing conditions. And uh, that uh, that's something uh, that we are uh, looking into and drive the process further. And uh, thank you very much for uh, listening and uh, pleasure talking with you. Thanks ever so much then, Joseph. We'll move straight on if we can then to Jonathan. And uh, I think Jonathan's going to tell us uh, Again, something very interesting, but probably from a slightly more slightly different perspective uh, and specifically to look more at launch vehicles. So, Jonathan, I shall hand straight over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Sean. Uh, you guys can see and hear me OK or see the slides and hear me OK, I guess. We can. Yes. Great. OK. So, yes, I guess this will be a much um, a higher level overview uh, compared to the, the to Joseph's talk. So uh, my name is Jonathan Volk. I'm with uh, Sierra Space. I'm in charge of in-space manufacturing and advanced materials uh, across all our platforms. Uh, just to start my uh, brief talk here, I'll let you guys read this while I talk. This is a comment from our CEO. A lot of times we think of space as you know, you're going to go exploration, habitation, but we're really utilizing space as well as a way to improve life on Earth through um, in-space manufacturing. So it's sort of a, a big component that sometimes doesn't get um, uh, recognized. So um, we, we think uh, uh, the next industrial revolution could potentially be in space. So uh, we've, we refer to it as the orbital age. Um, Overview of topics, I'll just, again, this will be very high level, start with why um, we're thinking low Earth orbit, just as a quick uh, uh, note, low Earth orbit is the uh, altitude uh, above where the International Space Station flies, uh, uh, where a lot of satellites are. So it's um, about uh, 400 kilometers above the surface of the Earth. That's the kind of the general altitude we're talking about here. Then I'll give a, a, a scientific overview and talk about some examples of how we translate to research from manufacturing and then close with some actual, um, uh, I guess, concrete examples of what we're actually developing and what currently exists. So three unique features of low Earth orbit will be uh, mainly focused on the first one, that's microgravity, um, but also there's extreme conditions of space, which are very valuable for materials testing in extreme environments, learning about how materials fail, and also the vantage point, looking at the planet uh, and the atmosphere, et cetera, for much larger data sets involving um, large global challenges, such as looking at uh, energy emissions, pollution, um, transportation, agriculture, weather patterns, et cetera. So a lot of work's been done in that area as well. So on the simplest of levels, uh, microgravity. So in, in a nutshell, this is really it right here. So a, a lot of processes, especially involving uh, materials, uh, formulation, manufacturing, et cetera, and also especially on the nanoscale are governed by gravitational forces. They play a big role. But the only way to mitigate those forces, to examine them, is to go to microgravity. So we can really look at uh, what other forces of a system that are present that play a role uh, in the performance or, or the, the effects of a, of, a, of a manufacturing process. We can't isolate those non-gravitational forces. So we go to microgravity to do that. And expanding this a little bit more, those gravitational forces include buoyancy, convection, and sedimentation. Again, those drive a lot of um, materials, formulation processes, manufacturing processes, and the like. So 
by going to microgravity, uh, by mitigating those, you can look at how diffusion, how surface tension, how conduction plays a role uh, in solely in driving those forces. Uh, and as Joseph mentioned, uh, there are parabolic flights, et cetera, that you can do these things on uh, very seconds to a few minutes. But again, that's not really possible uh, for a long-term scale. So that's why we go to low Earth orbit. If you want to do those uh, manufacturing processes, those material processes that are on the order of several minutes to hours to days. Uh, so there's the uh, opportunity to do that. And that's really the only place to do that. So this translates to a lot of different um, areas of material science and physical sciences research. Uh, there's been a lot of work done in material science already in low earth orbit, um, looking at how, do, uh, how does microstructure form? Uh, how do we evaluate material properties? Can we evaluate them more accurately in space without the gravitational influence? Then also looking at fluid dynamics, looking at multi-phase flow, how do things behave at an interface when you just have surface tension uh, affecting a system? looking at reaction chemistry, formulations, mixing, et cetera. Then I mentioned too about uh, external testing. So all these conditions that are present in the space environment, the rapid thermal cycling, atomic oxygen exposure, radiation, vacuum, and debris, et cetera. It's a great way to see how materials fail much quicker than you could on Earth. Um, and then that has not only has space applications, but Earth applications as well. So I know you guys, uh, NI is obviously has a big focus on industry. So I wanted to pass along some example payloads that have flown uh, to LEO, to ISS. So these are payloads that have, uh, have already flown or currently flying or about to fly. You can recognize uh, some names here of some uh, well-known brands, I, I would assume across the globe. Obviously they're big here in the US, but these are international companies that are really looking to, they look to utilize uh, the microgravity environment to make their products better? Could they make uh, something? Could they find something they could apply to their manufacturing processes here on the ground? I'll give you one example. The far left example, Procter & Gamble has flown, I believe, seven or eight. They've been the PI on seven or eight different experiments at the ISS. They've gotten several patents uh, from their work. So they've, uh, what we call them a frequent flyer. They like to go back and do more. And that's what uh, we like to see. So again, some of these uh, very large, well-known companies really uh, exploring um, uh, the microgravity environment to how that can be a, an innovative tool to improve their research, to improve their product development back down here on Earth. Uh, and more specifically here, uh, these are some sample example payloads I pulled related to nanotechnology, nanomaterials. You can see some are um, industry, some are academic. Uh, the links here will take you to uh, the NASA mission page where you can look for uh, much more of the publications that came out of it in much more detail. Um, and then the bottom line right here, I guess, I don't know if you guys can see my cursor, but this nasa.gov page here will take you to a link to the site where you can search even more uh, payloads that have been flown under your particular um, area of expertise in nanotechnology. And this does also include um, uh, payloads that have been in uh, NASA partnering organizations. So uh, for folks that are joining uh, from, from Europe, the, uh, all the ESA payloads, I believe, are on here. All the JAXA payloads are, are on here. So it's really a, a, a database of all the international payloads that have flown to the ISS. And again, it's searchable um, related to nanotechnology or any other keyword that might be of interest to you. So now transitioning from research to manufacturing, uh, we talk about how as I mentioned, how gravity influences manufacturing processes. In many cases, that can be in a negative way, and that can lead to defects in material formulation. So the fact that uh, in this, we've already seen some examples uh, going forward of actually thinking about uh, manufacturing in microgravity. Can you make a material that you just can't make on the ground, or can you make a material that you could make so much better than you could on the ground because you could really minimize the defects in the material? And that could lead to significant um, improvement in material properties, um, and then also maybe improve the, manu uh, improve the manufacturing process much more efficient. You don't have to scrap as many materials, et cetera, because again, uh, you're making materials with much more um, uh, fewer or no defects. So we kind of think about that general concept and we connect that to ground-based markets. All the manufacturing processes here on the left-hand column, um, from a, again, a fundamental physics standpoint, there could be uh, impacts uh, from gravitational forces on that process, again, many in a negative way. That could lead to all these types of materials. Uh, I apologize, I should have put nanomaterials at the top of this list, but uh, clearly they're, they're, they're very important here. Um, so all types of materials that are produced from these manufacturing processes could uh, potentially benefit uh, from production in microgravity. And that impacts a lot of those industrial markets on the right-hand 
um, uh, side here. And it all kind of kind of goes back and forth. Where uh, so I have the lines going both ways. Where you know these types of materials are made using different manufacturing processes. These markets touch different types of material classes and vice versa. So uh, I guess the the overall arching point of of this chart here is that manufacturing processes that could benefit from microgravity and manufacturing in space could really impact a lot of big terrestrial markets here on Earth. And the trajectory to get there, we obviously have to, we're not just gonna build um, things without, for, for the sake of building them, we really wanna validate um, uh, theory, validate the thought that, hey, uh, what, let's really show that we can make an improved product or a better material with fewer defects than we could on the ground and scale that up to um, actual full-scale manufacturing. And in my uh, last couple charts, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll talk on that a little more, how that transitions to kind of how the, uh, the, the space industry is going. So one, hopefully, uh, case study here that, that's hopefully tangible to a lot of you because we're really talking about uh, a very small, high-valued material. So uh, with semiconductor wafers, I'm sure um, for those of you, even if you're not based in the U.S., uh, the CHIPS Act here in the U.S. is, is a very hot topic. Uh, the U.S. is investing um, 50 plus billion dollars uh, in a program to really grow um, semiconductor manufacturing and R&D in the U.S., but also with um, international partners as well. So this is sort of a, a key uh, topic right here. So bottom line is, is I think I would think everyone knows here on this call that semiconductor uh, semiconductor wafers, computer chips, we're all getting smaller and smaller. Electronic devices, we're going from laptops to smartphones to smart watches and you know who knows what the next innovation will be we're, we're getting smaller and smaller and we need smaller and smaller chips uh, to meet the demands of, of that technology um, and potentially we might be approaching here kind of the theoretical limit of what we can achieve in a 1g environment are we going to get to a point where we just can't get any smaller uh, on the ground so uh, the chart here you look at you know from an economic standpoint you see here how the, the price per wafer as we get smaller and smaller, the cost is going up and up. Uh, and this, uh, the, the last line here, the five nanometer uh, node size was last estimated in 2020 at about uh, $17,000 for a 12 inch wafer. And now as we're talking about three nanometers, two nanometers, and even smaller, uh, I've seen things where 1.4, one, and even less than one are gonna be thought about uh, by the next decade. These are high valued materials you can see Based on this chart, uh, we can see that you know 50,000 plus for a, a two nanometer, 12 inch wafer that's manufactured on the ground. So if you're able to manufacture a material in microgravity, this wafer with significantly fewer defects, who knows what that could sell for? So again, the sort of uh, uh, highlights that I'm talking about quicker or earlier, are we reaching that theoretical limit where again, we just can't overcome the effects of gravity as we make um, wafers that require you know, smaller and smaller chip patterns. So that's something to think about too. And as again, on the economic side, as we manufacture in microgravity, you know, obviously the smaller the material we're thinking about, uh, nanotechnology, et cetera, it, it obviously makes sense because you know, you're not gonna manufacture, at least not now, an entire plane or a car. You, know, you need to manufacture materials that are low mass, low volume, defect driven and high value. And obviously uh, semiconductor materials check those boxes. Um, as do you know, various types of uh, nanomaterials. So um, as we think about that, obviously there needs to be a practicality of it if we're thinking about uh, manufacturing in space and uh, returning to earth. So some tangible things, and if I can uh, um, provide a lot, or at least a decent more information of actual tangible examples, but I wanted to kind of share here that some of the material or the equipment that's being developed um, for that's currently available in ISS, but also being developed for commercial platforms. Um, things like 3D printers, gradient furnaces to do crystallization, CVD capabilities, uh, levitation furnaces. Uh, JAXA already has one on ISS that um, can theoretically manufacture materials up with melting points up to 3000 C and also other types of furnaces. So we are really, you know, there are tangible examples of equipment that can do this type of materials R&D and manufacturing in space um, that do exist on ISS, but will also be available in hopefully bigger and better versions on some commercial platforms. So to go uh, just kind of bring this all together, right now, as I said, the ISS is the main platform to do this. 
um, but I think as uh, I think most of you know, it's reaching the end of its life. Um, 2030 is probably going to be the end and there needs to be a transition to something else. And the ISS wasn't really designed for uh, large scale manufacturing. It was barely designed to do the work that it's currently done as much as it's the work it's done. Um, it's a, you know, a lab with, you know, 1990s, early 2000 capability. And we obviously need to um, update that. And to do that, we're going to be use, utilizing commercial platforms. So, um, and when I showed that slide earlier about that transition from R&D to manufacturing, the ISS can handle some R&D, but to really get to full-scale manufacturing, we need a new platform to do that. So at Sierra Space, um, a couple of things we're doing. Uh, the near-term thing that we're working on is our Dream Chaser space plane. Uh, the initial launch of the, the first voyage, we have a, a car. We have a contract with NASA to do a uh, to do seven cargo missions to and from the ISS. The first one will be uh, later this year, um, and then obviously as it returns, similar to the space shuttle, we'll be able to land on a, a runway that can support you know a general uh, passenger aircraft. And that's obviously very important from the materials and manufacturing standpoint. If you want to manufacture, you know nanomaterials are very um, uh, high sensitive materials, materials that are very um, sensitive to damage and fracture upon crashing into the ground like we currently do uh, with, with, with a capsule. Uh, this will uh, obviously make it much more easier and much more safer return uh, to uh, really um, complete that, um, that cycle of manufacturing in space and returning to earth. So that's a very near term thing we're excited about. Then a component of our commercial platform is called the LIFE Habitat. It's an inflatable. LIFE is an acronym for Large Integrated Flexible Environment. And this will be um, a, a component uh, that will be able to support, that will be able to hold those types of manufacturing facilities I talked about a few slides earlier, like the furnaces, like the uh, CBD capability, et cetera. Um, so this is, this is kind of our, our commercial node, uh, a component of a larger platform called the orbital reef uh, and you can see here this life habitat this is one ex or one of the life habitats so um, orbital reef is a partnership uh, blue origin and sierra space are the two main partners we have several other teammates that are helping us construct uh, this commercial space station again this will be the 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 platform where this uh, advanced materials research will be done and where the in-space manufacturing will be done so uh, the timeline for this um, this will be obviously um, assembled much like iss was kind of component by component but at least a a functional subset of this so um, i figure at least a, a half of this volume will be um, available and functional before the end of the decade and then going it'll be um, assembled even farther to where it'll look like the picture uh, you see here probably by the early 2030s so that's kind of the end game here so i guess we'll transition to questions if you obviously this is a lot to think about here what what i've shared so this is my contact email. If you uh, think about what I've talked about here, if you don't have a question right away and you'd like to maybe ask a question or want to discuss something um, uh, a little later on, feel free to reach out to me. So with that, I will turn it back over to Sean. So Jonathan, thank you ever so much for that interesting presentation. And Joseph, uh, thank you for yours beforehand. Uh, we've got time for some questions, and I think, in fact, uh, we have our first question. So, uh, Edgar, I'll ask you to switch your microphone on, and please, obviously, ask your question. Hello, thank you for the presentation and chance to ask a question. Uh, Jonathan, do you, uh, how startups and small companies can have access to manufacturing materials? Do you have sure. a base of patents or, um, like, some organizations, uh, sub organizations, which are working. Yeah. This, I mean. So there are um, there are small small companies we feel are, are a big um, contributor to this. Um, and actually, it was in a slide. I probably should have talked about it. So there's a company called Lamb Division. Um, they're manufacturing retinal implants in space. Uh, they've done I think seven or eight launches. Uh, they're kind of the the um, a great. Uh, 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 or a customer testimonial, um, but we do work, there's been a lot of small companies through, uh, and we partner sometimes too with programs to um, do like things like innovation challenges. I would also encourage you, um, there's something we're just, it's, it's very um, nascent, but it's called Sierra Space Ventures, um, sierraspaceventures.com. Um, 
and that's something you can submit an idea to or interested in, you know, looking at supporting um, startups as well. Uh, but wherever you're based in, and obviously we're a commercial company, so that's another thing I should point out. Um, obviously on the ISS side, it's, a, um, you know, on the U.S. side, there's U.S. assets, but obviously being a commercial company, this won't be really, um, our platform will be open, you know, internationally, which is, you um, which is a, a big plus. Um, but then I, there, there's, there's a lot of initiatives and, and we're, we're becoming involved with, um, especially like with ESA, I know they're having some accelerator programs and incubators for um, in-space manufacturing and also on the US side as well. So um, there's a lot of opportunity. Again, I would check out Sierra Space Ventures, um, but if you wanna talk more specifically to what you're looking to do, um, I'm happy to do so offline. Do you have one in Los Angeles or in California? Um, I, I don't know if we have a, if we're working with any companies. I know there's a couple of accelerators um, that are based, that are focused on space in California, but it doesn't really matter. Um, I mean, where, wherever, wherever your company's based, it's not real. I mean, for the most part, um, we're, we're open to, you know, uh, f supporting what you want to do and potentially flying a, a payload. Um, to ISS or to our commercial platforms once they're available. Jonathan, I will add you in LinkedIn and we'll ask you to send some links. Thank sure. You for, yep. for sure. And uh, I think we, we have another question from uh, Bakir. Uh, hi, uh, maybe for Jonathan question. Mm -hmm. So uh, just trying to understand this, uh, it, um, as far as I know, at the nanoscale, if you do any exercise, Van der Waals force dominates heavily over gravity. And I understand you talk to some extent to the economy of the things and manufacturing. And I can see some benefit putting it at the low gravity, but kind of uh, fundamentally at the nanoscale, if you don't look that manufacturing is, is at macro scale or even micro scale, should you know, very weakly dependent on gravity. And, um, you know, what scale of manufacturing you would have to have before you can economically justify all the infrastructure building in the space? Yep, so I asked you your first question. And, and in general, obviously there's, you know, the, the smaller you get, there are some manufacturing processes that would make sense. So it's obviously on kind of on a case by case basis. Um, again, from an economic standpoint, um, you know, a lot of it, we're, we're doing a lot of research, you know, and it's sort of, we don't really, you, you trying to figure out, you know, how much, you know, a, a product with, 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 with superior properties, again, it, it's, it's trying to understand what, what the market demand would be. We have a lot of people trying to do a lot of, of economic projections, um, but then also to the type of model that you would want to do, um, are you manufacturing? And from our side, obviously, is having the platform. Is it, are we manufacturing the product or is a company putting a manufacturing capability on our facility and they're manufacturing the product? Um, again, it, it goes on a case-by-case -case basis, but uh, obviously, as I mentioned earlier, um, it really it practically would need to be small mass, small volume, defect driven and high value. Um, and, you know, it's not just a one-off thing. You want to, you want it to be, you know, you're manufacturing at scale, like it's, it's a factory in space uh, per se. And that's another point I should mention too. Another reason with these commercial platforms, the ISS is continuously crude. A lot of these commercial platforms might not be continuously crude. And that's important depending on what you want to make, obviously for, you know, safety concerns for having a, a, a crude vehicle. So being able to have a functional uncrewed facility that can really work 24 seven to make it enough of a product where there is a, a economic benefit um, is something that, that we have to value. Okay, uh, whilst people might be thinking of other questions, uh, I've just got a quick question for Joseph, if that's okay. It's interesting because obviously on being able to understand the effects of gravity before you leave the earth uh, and being able to model that is obviously going to be much cheaper than leaving the earth to actually try out some of these experiments. But I was just wondering how, predict how predictable are these models at the minute? Uh, uh, they are, uh, I mean, uh, they are predictable 
to the at least to the duration that these are tested in other experimental conditions and that has to be the starting point before expanding this modeling to real long duration application so from our experience uh, uh, they are quite predictable of course it depends on the complexities of uh, uh, properties at single particle scale and for some systems uh, much more uh, easy to handle with for other systems we need to look into a lot of fundamental experimentation to get these particle scale properties before uh, taking it further but overall these are repeatable for the kind of uh, parabolic flight tests that we were associated with with simulations they are quite comparable okay excellent and just also maybe with joseph and jonathan uh, how useful is this kind of base knowledge going to be? Because obviously there's going to be some base knowledge in some basic knowledge in here that in, for example, modeling where people uh, or companies who are interested in moving into, and I love that idea, by the way, of the, the orbital age of sort of taking the manufacturing to space. How critical is it going to be to get that knowledge transferred in such a way that's going to allow companies who might not have that experience to kind of share this kind of vision and these kind of opportunities. And maybe Jonathan first. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So it's um it's obviously important. I mean, to make this much of investment as we go on this, you have to do those those proof of concept work. There's been a little bit of work done. Um, but again, when we look at you know test cases, the 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 end, and you know, you're not you're not going to get thousands and thousands of trials in certain fields like we've gotten for you know any type of research on the ground. So it's important to maximize our value and uh, you know suborbital parabolic flights. If if the science can be done in that time scale, it's going to be very important because it's it's much more cheaper and much more readily, much more frequent to do. So if you can really boost the confidence level and and um, you know that's important and then that data can be can be definitely utilized so it's overall yes it's going to be very as much data as we can get is going to be important to ensure um ensure the greatest chances of, of success once we get up there and start doing manufacturing in space and joseph i assume this yeah, is just to, just to add that your perspective. Uh, yeah, I, I, I entirely agree with uh, what jonathan said uh, but uh, simultaneously the Computing technology is also increasing. I mean, it's, it's, it's growing up. Uh, so whatever that were not possible beforehand, uh, starting from nano micro mechanical kind of approach to reduced gravita gravitational environments that were not possible 10 years back are beginning to be possible now. So it comes by uh, talking much more closely and assessing the individual needs and taking it further. Okay, excellent. Uh, I don't know if any other audience member has any other questions? No, not seeing any hands up or anything else or anything in the chat. You know, I mean, as I, as I said, Jonathan, I really, I really did love the idea, this idea of the the sort of orbital age. I, I actually, to be fair, not considered it before, this idea that maybe, maybe space uh, as a manufacturing platform rather than just purely uh more on the idea of uh using using the moon for example as a as a lunar launch for the next the next part but is that one of your eventual sort of interests as well is to look and see how you can maybe start up uh using space as an initial platform to 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 explore the galaxy further yeah i would say just and this is a general uh, comment and i'm there's there's a lot of consortia being developed around in-space manufacturing, especially on the U.S. side. And the part that I've talked about, manufacturing in space for Earth, is just a small part of that overall kind of roadmap. Uh, people are thinking, you know, how can we utilize um, resources in space for manufacturing, looking at, you know, um, uh, lunar mining, and et cetera, looking at, you know, asteroid mining uh, to be able to have a, a, um, a, a closed a closed manufacturing system in space because that will be important as we think about as we you know go out farther and farther as we stay up there longer and longer so yes that's that's definitely a a, a, um, a big part that the in space manufacturing community and the space community as a whole is um, really trying to evaluate and identify key points of okay and sounds it sounds like the future the future is there <laughs> the future is coming quicker than any of us anticipated for sure uh 
Yeah, and I think the digital age has shown us that things uh, move faster than we perhaps anticipate, and it's how quickly we can all keep up and get ahead of some of the technology. And uh, I think today it's been really interesting to hear from all three of the speakers. Uh, and I say, unless there's any other questions, I think we can wrap up now. Uh, and as ever, just wrap up by saying thank you ever so much to all three speakers. I think it's been really interesting to hear about some of the opportunities uh, to see what some of the uh, some of the future maybe holds for for us, uh, and to obviously say thank you to uh, Yolanda, to Joseph, and to Jonathan for three interesting presentations. Uh, thank you to the audience for coming. And if anybody has interest, then follow uh, the NIA. We will have further events uh, coming up uh, later in the year. If anyone has any interesting topics that they'd like to think about. Uh, again, just communicate those to us because we can always try and cover different topics as well. And just to say thank you to everyone for attending. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks all. Thanks, Sean.